Hi, everybody. Welcome to tonight's astronomy outreach event. It's so lovely to see everybody. Isn't it nice that it cleared up? <laughs> this morning when I got up, I was like, aww. And then at one o'clock, aww. And then at four o'clock, <laughs> Suddenly it was clear, so they knew we were having an event tonight. So I'm really excited about tonight's event, uh, in no small part because Heather Knutson, our speaker, has been one of my very good friends for 10 years, also an excellent astrophysicist, but very importantly, my friend, <laughs> which is why I wanted to introduce her. Um, I want to walk you through tonight's event. It's a multi-parter. So we're going to start off with Heather's lecture. Heather, t Heather will talk for about 30 minutes. Uh, then she'll answer questions, and then you have options to choose your own adventure night. You can go outside onto the field and do some stargazing. To do that, you'll go out those doors you came in, down the side of the building to where the sign is, and out onto the, onto the field. There are rules on the field. <laughs> ah, we're only allowed to use it if we're nice to it. They just had it re-turfed last year. So no high heels, no food, no drink, and no litter, please. We'd love for them to let us keep using the field. And if we trash it, they won't. So option one, go stargazing. Thankfully, the clouds cleared, as we talked about. Uh, what we're going to be looking at tonight is the moon, Jupiter, and maybe the beehive cluster, depending on the lights in LA. It's a long weekend, maybe a lot of people left, maybe we won't be able to see it. It's, that's our stretch goal, our stretch goal is the beehive. Uh, or you can stay in here, uh, and for about an hour or so after Heather's talk, we'll have an expert Q&A panel with myself and some of the Caltech grad students who cover a range of topics that we can answer questions about, and that'll just be a free-form discussion. You guys ask us what you want to know about. Uh, you can come and go to those things. You don't all have to rush out to the field or stay here. There's, it goes for an hour and a half. You can come back and forth. If the line's along at the telescope, come back inside and ask a question. So this is one of a series of events that we have. Uh, who's here tonight for the first time to one of our outreach events? Welcome. Oh, that's very exciting. Uh, we have little surveys out the front on the table. It would be really great to find out how you heard about it and why you're here tonight. That's really exciting. Thank you for coming. As I said, this is one in a series. This piece of paper out the front has some of our other events on it. This is the second last event in, uh, second last lecture in our calendar. Our calendar goes till June, but we're already working on next week's, next year's calendar, which will start in July, so there won't be a gap. You can come back every month and hear awesome astronomy talks and hopefully see the sky. Next month, it's Greg Hallinan, uh, who's a professor here, uh, and he's gonna talk about fast radio bursts. And I don't know what they are either, so <laughs> I'll have to come back as well. All right, with that, I think it's time to bring Heather up. Thank you, Heather. Heather's going to talk to us about exoplanets. If you were here last month, I gave you a primer, and Heather's going to take it over from there. Thank you, Heather. Let me turn the lights down. All right, you guys can all hear me in the back? Excellent. Okay. Uh, so I'm excited to be here tonight to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing to explore planets, not in our own solar system, but actually planets around other stars. So many of you may know this as sort of the territory of science fiction. I certainly grew up reading books about what it might be like to visit some of these planets. Uh, but up until recently, we really didn't know what any of these planets were like. So what I want to tell you about tonight is a little bit of the story of how we've discovered planets around other stars. That's very new. We've only been able to do it for about 20 years now. And once we could discover those planets, what are some of the kinds of planets that we've found? What can we learn about these planets? Are we finding planets like our own? Uh, and just to sort of give you a little bit of a hint, it turns out that many of the planets that we see around other stars are very weird and different than the planets in our own solar system. So it's going to be a fun trip. All right, uh, so when we're looking for planets, uh, we can make a very simple list of questions that we might want to answer, uh, sort of ordered from easiest things to hardest things. So the very first question that we want to answer is, you know, if I pick a random star in the night sky, how likely is it that that star has a planet around it? So we want to know how common or rare planets are generally. Once I know the answer to that question, uh, and I've, I've started making a list of planets now that I've found around nearby stars, I might want to know a little bit more about those planets. And so the very next question I might ask is, uh, what kind of planet have I found? So have I found a planet which is mostly gas, like Jupiter, or have I found a planet which is mostly rock, like the Earth? So I can start to sort my planets into bins. But, uh, you know, say I find a rocky planet, it, it looks kind of Earth-like, maybe it's, it's about Earth temperature, I, I don't want to stop it. Is it a ball of rock or not? You know, Venus is a ball of rock. Mars is a ball of rock. But they're very different planets than the Earth. So the next sort of question that I might want to ask is, 
does my planet have an atmosphere? And if so, what is that atmosphere made of? And so that's an important part of our picture of what these planets are like. Knowing the answer to that question lets us figure out, is this a planet like Mars or Venus or Earth, even though they're all rocky planets? Uh, okay, so um, we can answer uh, what kinds of planets there are. So say, you know, we really lucked out. We found a rocky planet. It's, it's kind of Earth temperature. It has an atmosphere that's kind of Earth-like. We're getting really, really excited. There's maybe one more question that we want to answer, and that's probably the most important question of all with these planets. And so that question, I think you guys are already guessing, is, is there life on that planet? And so that's one of the big questions that motivates a lot of these projects, is we love studying planets, we love all different kinds of planets, but at the end of the day, one of the really big questions we want to know the answer to is, are we alone in the universe? And studying these other planets is a path towards eventually being able to answer that question. Okay, so starting out on that path, uh, how do we find planets around other stars? So this is just an image of the night sky taken from a small telescope, probably pretty similar to the ones that you guys will be using tonight. Uh, most of the points of light in this image are stars. And so we could pick a star at random and we could ask, uh, what is the chance that that star right there has a planet around it? So that's an easy question to ask, but it's not such an easy question to answer. And so that's why this is a pretty new field. So I think the very first idea that all of us have when we think about looking for planets is, all right, we just need to kind of zoom in on that planet, uh, you know, get a really, really high resolution picture, and maybe you could see something that looks a little bit like this. So you're going to see the bright point of light, which is the star, and maybe next to it, if you can look closely enough, you'll see a little faint point of light, which is the planet. So that's a great idea in theory. It turns out it's really hard to do, and so that's actually not how we found most of the planets that we've detected to date. Uh, so we, we found a few planets this way, but very, very few. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of how difficult a problem this actually is, there's a great analogy uh, that actually someone I worked with uh, in grad school came up with. She's a professor at MIT. Uh, so she's working with National Geographic. They're writing an article on these planets, and they're trying to come up with an analogy for how hard it is to actually take a picture of one. And so this is what they came up with. They said, imagine getting one of these really bright spotlights that you would see in Hollywood, and now imagine that you take a firefly, and you put the firefly about a foot away from the spotlight. And now imagine that you want to take a picture where you can see that firefly next to the spotlight. But the firefly and the spotlight are sitting here in Los Angeles, and you, the photographer, are in New York City. And that's about the scale of the problem that you have when you want to take a picture of a planet around another star. So it's shocking that we've actually managed to do it, uh, but it's also a really difficult problem. So uh, one solution when you run into really difficult, technically challenging problems in science is to think of a creative workaround. And so rather than diving headfirst into the really hard things, the very creative people thought of a good solution that avoids the problem of having to take a picture of the planet. And in fact, the National Geographic photographer who was trying to do this picture uh, stumbled onto the solution by accident. So uh, they asked this MIT professor, they said, well, we're really having a hard time getting the firefly to show up in our picture. And we're not even in New York City. They're right now next to it, and they still can't get the firefly to show up. So they said, what if we had the firefly fly in front of the spotlight? Then it would show up in our picture. And the MIT professor said, yes, that's exactly it. That's the solution. So um, you should know, National Geographic cheated. The picture that you have up here tonight, they photoshopped the firefly. So in the end, they could not solve this very hard problem, even being right next to it. So they cheated, um, but we can cheat a different way. Uh, so it turns out that um, some of these planets actually pass in front of the star as seen from the Earth. And so this is actually a video uh, taken uh, in 2012 when we actually got to see Venus transit the sun. So this is a video of Venus passing in front of the sun as seen from the Earth. And so now imagine that you are here on the Earth and you're looking at one of these distant stars in the night sky, and it just so happens that one of the planets around that star lines up just so that it actually passes in front of the star. It's going to block part of the star's light. So even without being able to directly see the planet, we can infer the presence of the planet by measuring the brightness of the star and watching as it dims and then gets brighter. And that's going to be something that's going to recur at regular intervals, because planets have these nice constant orbits. So once every orbit, the planet's going to go in front of the star, and the star is going to get dim. So it's this nice, regular, periodic signal that we can see. Uh, we can do it from Earth. The very first 
um, eclipsing planetary systems were actually discovered using small uh, telescopes, similar to the ones that you guys will use. Uh, but by far, the most successful planet hunting mission to date actually was in space. And that's because in space, uh, you get to avoid a lot of the messy complications that come from the fact that when you're on Earth, you have to look up through the atmosphere. Sometimes it's cloudy, those clouds get in the way, but even if it's not cloudy, the atmosphere's changing in time, and that makes it really hard to measure the brightness of these stars very precisely. So we do this way, way better from space. And so um, this is an image of the Kepler telescope, which some of you may have heard of. So Kepler launched in 2009, and its job, its single job, was to stare at a 100-degree uh, square patch of sky located near the constellation Cygnus. So uh, there is the area that Kepler was staring at. So there's Cygnus. And uh, what Kepler did was to measure the brightness of about 150,000 stars within that square patch of sky and to just do that continuously for a period of four years. So what Kepler was looking for is it was looking for stars that periodically dimmed in brightness due to the presence of a planet passing in front of that star. And so Kepler was tremendously successful. Um, its, its legacy today is that we have a list of more than 5,000 planets and planet candidates. So this is the single most successful planet hunting mission ever by a big margin. And uh, so most of what we know about planets and others, around other stars comes from this mission. So um, one thing that Kepler told us is that it turns out that uh, planets are actually pretty common that most of the stars that Kepler looked at have planets around them. And so that number um, probably is gonna grow even bigger because Kepler could only find planets that are relatively close in. It only looked for four years. You need to see a couple of eclipses, so it's finding things sort of out to the distance of Earth. But nonetheless, even searching only to that distance, Kepler found a lot of planets. And so that was really exciting. So we know that planets aren't rare, that uh, most stars probably have one or more planets around them. Uh, but I think that another really exciting thing was the realization that we were seeing some very different kinds of planetary systems. So not only did Kepler tell us that planets were common, it also told us about the different kinds of planetary systems that are out there and sort of their relative frequency. So just to give you kind of a sampling of that, um, here's a scale image of the solar system focusing on the region that Kepler searched. So remember, Kepler can only see planets out to about the orbit of Earth. So here's the solar system planets, and in this drawing, the sizes of the planets are to scale, and their distances are to scale. They're not to the same scale, otherwise the planets would be tiny points of light, but so you can see in, in a relative sense how big the planets are and how far they are away from the sun. So that's the solar system. Uh, Kepler found many planetary systems which look like this one in the middle. So that was one surprise is that uh, you know, planets apparently are so common that you can find stars which have inside of Mercury's orbit not one, not two, not three, but five planets, all of which are appreciably bigger than the Earth. So uh, depending on what these planets are made of, we call them either super-Earths or mini-Neptunes. So super-Earths would be kind of big rocks. Uh, mini-Neptunes would be sort of smaller versions of Neptune uh, with a little bit of hydrogen and helium on top. But uh, these systems turn out to be surprisingly common. Uh, another kind of planetary system, which we actually knew about before Kepler launched, this was actually the very first kind of planet we found around nearby stars, uh, was a kind of planet called a hot Jupiter. So you might guess from the name, this is a gas giant planet, very similar to Jupiter, but one which orbits right next to the star. So many of these planets go around their stars in a period of just a couple of days. So these are really right up I'm uh, not touching the star, but very, very close to the star. So the sort of theme, if there is a theme uh, for exoplanets so far, is that we find that most planetary systems that we look at appear to be different than our own. And mostly what that means is that when we look at a region which is really empty in our own solar system, we find that many stars have planets in that region and that those planets can be quite large. So we don't know why that is yet. We don't have a good story for why, uh, it, you know, what the environment has to be to make this kind of planetary system versus that one versus that one. Uh, but it's clear that there are a variety of different outcomes that are possible from the planet formation process. And that's already pretty interesting. So planets are common. Solar systems may be rare. And by rare, I don't mean like one in a million. Uh, by rare, I mean they're not the majority. 
so less than 50%, um, maybe at the order of a few percent to 10%, but definitely not the majority of planetary systems. All right. So Kepler was really good at finding planets, and uh, it told us where these planets were located, and it also told us something else about those planets, which is when the planet goes in front of the star, we can measure the amount of light blocked by the planet, and by measuring that decrease in light, we can tell the size of the planet relative to the star. So Kepler tells us where planets are located, and it tells us their radius. But if we want to know what kind of planet we found, that's not enough information, because I could make a ball of rock and a ball of gas, and I could make them exactly the same size. So radius alone isn't enough to start to categorize these different kinds of planets. All right. So we have our list of planets. Now we want to know what we found. What kinds of planets are out there? How common are rocky planets? How common are gas giant planets? How big can you be and still be rocky? How small can you get and still have a hydrogen atmosphere? These are all interesting questions to ask, and in order to answer them, we need another piece of information. And that other piece of information is we need to know the mass of the planet. So if we know a mass and we know a radius, then we can calculate a density. And that makes it really obvious if our planet is a ball of hydrogen gas or a ball of rock or something in between. Could be a water planet, all kinds of different things. So I mentioned before, we measure the size of the planet, its radius, by uh, measuring the brightness of the star as a function of time. So here we measure brightness, the planet goes in front of the star, it blocks part of the star's light, we see a dip, the planet moves past the star and it rises again. So we measure the depth of this dip and that tells us the radius of the planet. So how do we figure out the mass of these planets? How do we weigh these planets? So in order to do that, we can use a different technique, which would uh, relies around on the fact that as the planet orbits its star, the planet is actually going to exert a pull on the star. So the star is not going to sit there perfectly motionless with the planet orbiting around it. As the planet goes around, it's going to tug the star a little bit back and forth. And even though we can't see the planet, we can measure the motion of the star uh, using a technique called the Doppler technique. So as the planet pulls the star towards us, we see its light is blue shifted, and as the planet pulls the star away from us, we see its light is red shifted. So we can measure that little tiny motion of the star, and from that we can infer uh, the, the mass or the weight of the planet that's pulling on the star. So mass and radius give us density. Density tells us what kind of planet we're finding. So now the question is, what kinds of planets are out there? So I've said planets are common. I've given you some examples of different kinds of planetary systems that we see. Uh, so let's now talk about the different kinds of planet compositions that we see. So this is the only plot with actual measurements I'm going to show you tonight. Uh, but I, I think it's useful because it, it tells us uh, exactly what kind of planet we're looking at. So here on the bottom is the mass of the planet in units of Earth masses. So here's the Earth and Venus down here. Here on the y-axis is radius. So you have mass and you have radius. So Earth and Venus there, Uranus and Neptune there. Saturn there, Jupiter there. So we can put all of the extrasolar planets for which we've measured masses and radii on this plot. So these are all the black points here. And we can ask, do they look like Jupiter up here? So in that case, their densities are low. They're probably planets which are mostly hydrogen gas. Uh, and you can see that by comparing them to these different lines. So these are just toy models. If I make a planet that's pure water, it looks like this. If I make a planet that's pure rock, it looks like that. So if you want to know what your planet is made of, you ask what line is it close to. All right, uh, so these are balls of gas, mostly hydrogen. And as we go to smaller and smaller planets, you can see that their densities are going up. So we know that Uranus and Neptune in our own solar system, although they have a hydrogen envelope, they have relatively large rocky or icy cores. So we see that Neptunes around other stars also have larger cores. And then as we go to smaller and smaller planets, we start to see the first planets, which are probably rocky. So these guys down here are probably Earth-like in the sense that they're mostly rocky. They might have a thin atmosphere on top, but effectively, at this level of resolution, it's a ball of rock. Now, the really interesting thing is actually the part in between. So again, going back to this theme that we see kinds of planets around other stars that don't exist in our solar system that we'd never expected to see, uh, we were really surprised to see, so in the solar system you have gas giants and ice giants here, 
and then you have nothing until you get down to the rocky planets, which are pretty tiny by comparison. But there's a whole bunch of planets in between. So we see many, many planets orbiting nearby stars, which are bigger than the Earth, but smaller than Neptune. What are these planets? Uh, some of them are probably rocky, these ones down here. But uh, some of them are up here, and they kind of lie near this water line. So maybe these are water worlds. These could be things which are mostly water uh, in their mantles. They might also be mixtures of different things. So you could make a ball of rock and put just a little bit of hydrogen gas on top, and you could probably make something with about that density. So these are really interesting, mysterious objects. Uh, and we actually are still trying to figure out what these are. So this is one of the things that um, you know, all of us have been working very hard to try and answer. And uh, I'd like to get up here and tell you today that we know the answer, but uh, I'll tell, tell you in a little bit uh, why we haven't found out the answer yet. We're getting there, but we're not there yet. All right. Um, so uh, you know if it's a ball of rock or a mostly gassy planet like Jupiter, the next thing you want to know, uh, say it's a ball of rock, you might want to know whether or not it has an atmosphere. And so it turns out this is actually something that we can measure. So these tiny planets that we never directly see around other stars, I can tell you if it has an atmosphere, I can tell you what that atmosphere is made of, I can measure the temperature of the planet, and I can even make maps of temperature and clouds uh, as a function of longitude on the planet, all for a planet which I never directly see. And that's the really cool trick about these eclipsing systems. So how do I actually do that? So when the planet passes in front of the star, uh, if it's a ball of rock, it's going to block exactly the same amount of light from the star no matter what wavelength I look at. A ball of rock is a ball of rock is a ball of rock. But if that planet has an atmosphere, that atmosphere is going to be opaque at some wavelengths and it's going to be transparent at other wavelengths. So if I measure how much light the planet blocks as a function of wavelength, I should see something which varies as I go from short wavelengths out to long wavelengths. So that wavelength-dependent variation in the apparent size of the planet tells me that it has an atmosphere, and it allows me to detect the presence of different molecules in that atmosphere. So I can look for things like water vapor. I can look for things like methane, carbon monoxide. Uh, all of those things are things which we've actually detected in the atmospheres of some of these planets. All right, uh, if the planet goes in front of the star, uh, inevitably it will go behind the star as well. If we wait just about half an orbit, so it's going to disappear behind the star and reappear. If we look at that uh, secondary eclipse at longer wavelengths in infrared light, we can actually measure the thermal emission from the planet, and we can inf uh, then translate that into a temperature for the planet. So I can tell you, does it have an atmosphere? What's it made of? And I can tell you how hot or cold the planet is. All right. Um, I also mentioned making maps of planets. So we can learn not just about the sort of global property of the planet. We can actually ask uh, what the planet looks like um, on the day side and on the night side, and if those two things are different. Uh, in order to do that, what we're, uh, we're doing is we're watching. So we're watching as the planet goes in front of the star, and then we're watching as it comes around behind the star. And so as it's doing that, we're seeing different parts of the planet. So if the day side is really hot and the night side is really cold, and we watch as that day side comes around into view, we can actually measure a change in the brightness of the planet. So we can actually map the atmospheres of these planets and look at uh, sort of weather and climate patterns in their atmospheres. All right. So uh, those are all the things that we'd like to do with these eclipsing systems. How do we actually do it? So the state of the art for these observations is mainly to use space telescopes. All of the very best observations we have of the atmospheres of these planets uh, mostly come from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, so it's really fun to use the Hubble Telescope to look at these systems. Uh, it's, it's really, there's, there's no better way to make these measurements. When you're up above the Earth's atmosphere, everything is really constant and stable in time, and you just get really, really beautiful measurements of these eclipses. Uh, there's a little bit of a downside. So when I observe with the Hubble, I obviously I don't get a trip up on the shuttle, so I don't get to go to the Hubble and use it. Uh, so what happens is that I write a script, and well, actually, first I write a proposal, and I say, please, 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 can you look at my favorite planet? And it gets reviewed by a panel of expert astronomers, and they say, well, hmm, all right, you make a good case for why it's an amazing planet, you can look at it. So then I do a little victory dance. I said, yes, I can look at it with Hubble. Uh, and then I write a script, and I say, point it my favorite star, 
at the right time to see my favorite planet pass in front of it, observe it at this wavelength with this instrument and this filter, and I send that script off to Hubble, and it goes in a scheduling queue. And I wait, and I wait, and I wait, and many months later, I get a message that says, your data has been taken, you can download it from the Hubble website. And I do another victory dance, and I download my data, and I start doing science. But I never actually leave my desk. So this is all done from my office. So uh, for that reason, it's also really amazing to be able to observe with some of the great ground-based observatories. And so one of my favorite observatories on the ground is actually one which uh, has maybe been in the news a little bit recently. So this is Keck Observatory. Uh, so Caltech is a partner um, in the Keck Consortium. So we are one of the universities that uses the Keck telescopes. It is on the summit of Mauna Kea. So it is on the summit of an active volcano, which has been erupting recently. Not that exact peak. There's no lava there. but uh, kind of off in the distance down that way, uh, there'd be a little bit of lava. So fortunately, it has not affected the telescopes. But uh, you can actually go to the summit of Mauna Kea. You can be at the telescope, stay up all night, and be able to walk outside and say, you know, that star up there, that's what I'm looking at tonight. And that's the telescope that I'm using to look at, uh, to observe it with. And so that's really amazing. Uh, it doesn't hurt either. <laughs> It doesn't hurt either that it's in Hawaii. Um, when I was a grad student, I, I was in Boston. And uh, my favorite thing, which almost never happened, but it was amazing when it did, was to be able to go observing uh, in Hawaii in March. Because March is a terrible time to be in Boston, and it's an amazing time to be in Hawaii. <laughs> but uh, I will say that I took this picture on one of those observing runs when I was a grad student. And I will tell you that this picture was taken in right about this time of year, late May. So you will notice that in this picture, there is snow. So when I went to Hawaii, I brought my parka, I brought my hat and my gloves, and I was up on this snowy summit and it was cold. So I was not on the beach, unfortunately. All right, <laughs> so a little bit of a downside. Go to the tops of tall mountains, it is typically pretty cold. All right, uh, so what have we learned so far? So I, I told you very briefly a little bit about how we might study the atmospheres of these planets and maybe even learn a little bit about their climate. Uh, so what have we learned to date? So uh, earlier I said we would love to do these things for rocky planets that might be like the Earth. Unfortunately, we have not done that yet. Uh, the very first planets that we've tried to study. So you don't want to do the really hard thing first. You want to do the easy thing first, figure out if you can do it, and then try the hard thing. So that's where we're at right now. So the easy thing in this case is to study these hot Jupiters, these big gas giant planets that orbit very close to their stars. They're the easiest things we can look at. They're very big, they're very bright by comparison to the Earth. So these are going to be the easiest uh, targets to do these sorts of studies. So uh, looking at these hot Jupiters, what have we discovered with our Hubble uh, and Keck observations? So um, we know, not surprisingly, that these are hydrogen-rich atmospheres. So these are big, puffy balls of gas. We have measured uh, water in the atmospheres of these planets. They're so hot, they don't have water clouds. It's all steam, water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, we see evidence for methane and carbon monoxide as well. Those are also things that we would expect to see if you took Jupiter and heated it up to like several thousand degrees you would be able to see all those elements, in its, or all those molecules, rather, in its atmosphere. Uh, what else do we do? We can measure the temperatures of these hot Jupiters. It's maybe not a surprise that they're hot. We kind of knew that from their orbits. Uh, but we can actually see exactly what their temperatures are. And that tells us something about how ref reflective their atmospheres are. If their atmospheres were able to reflect a lot of that light, they might be slightly cooler. If they really absorb all the light that hits them, then they'll be hotter. We can see that. And it also tells us about how hot the day side is relative to the night side. So we can actually measure the day-night gradient in the atmospheres of these planets. All right. Um, so we, if we measure the day side and night side temperatures for these planets, uh, we find that they're actually not that different. So there may be a couple hundred degrees different. That sounds like a big difference, but relative to what they could be, it's pretty small. And so what that tells us is that these planets have really fast winds that are really good at redistributing the heat absorbed on the day side and sending it around to the night side. So this is an artist's impression of a hot Jupiter, but now I'm going to overlay on top of that an actual map that we've made of the atmosphere of one of these hot Jupiters. So this is a temperature map. Brighter is hotter, fainter is colder. 
And uh, so you can see that this planet has a hot region in the day side atmosphere. That hot region has actually shifted a little bit away from the center of the day side. And that's because of winds that are circulating at the equator. So we actually infer the presence of very fast winds in the atmospheres of these planets. Another really interesting discovery is that these planets actually are cloudy. And that was surprising because uh, if we look at the atmosphere of the Earth, we see that the Earth has water clouds, but we know from the temperatures of these planets that they are way too hot for water clouds. But it turns out, uh, even though these planets are very hot, there are other things which are maybe in liquid phase at these temperatures. So it turns out some of these planets probably have clouds that are made from liquid rock. Uh, possibly even liquid iron if you get hot enough. Uh, on the slightly cooler side, you could have salt clouds. So there are some pretty exotic cloud species in the atmospheres of these planets. And so this is actually, these aren't images, these are just uh, actually from models, climate models of these planets. Uh, these are what they would look like if we could see them in visible light. So the bright regions are cloudy regions in the atmosphere, and the color of those bright regions changes depending on the exact thing, uh, cloud species that you have. So you have uh, rock clouds, salt clouds, and then maybe, uh, this is actually thermal emission up here, but maybe a little bit of iron clouds for some of them. All right, uh, so the very last thing I wanted to mention is, is we've done this for hot Jupiters, but uh, you know, at the beginning of my talk, I said we really wanted to do this for smaller planets, because one of these big questions that we want to get to is whether or not there's life elsewhere in the universe. And so in order to answer that question, we want to know how common or rare planets like the Earth might be and if we found planets that seem promising, we want to be able to check for signs of life that we might be able to see by looking, for instance, at the composition of their atmospheres. So the challenge is this. These are the kinds of planets that we're studying right now. This is the kind of planet that we want to study. So these planets are already pretty hard to make these measurements for, even with the best telescopes that we have available today, the Hubble telescope. And so if we want to go from looking at something as big as this to something as big as that, we clearly need something to change. So we can't just take Hubble and point it at a small planet and expect to detect anything about its atmosphere. So uh, again, we could build a really, really big telescope in space. We could build like a 15 meter telescope in space. That would be awesome. But it would be tremendously expensive and we probably wouldn't be able to build it for a really long time. So uh, we are impatient people. We would like to know sooner than that uh, what the atmospheres of these rocky planets are made of. And so again, uh, someone came up with a clever trick. And that clever trick was to say, well, this is a really hard problem if you think about looking at a planet the size of the Earth going in front of a star the size of the sun. But stars come in all different sizes. And there are many stars out there which are much smaller than our sun. So there are stars which are only 10% the size of the sun. And if I take that rocky planet and I put it in orbit around one of those small stars, everything gets a lot easier. Because remember, what you see is the eclipse. So you see the amount of light blocked by the planet when it goes in front of the star. And so the eclipse of an Earth going in front of a sun is a tiny, tiny signal. But this uh, eclipse created by uh, that same Earth going in front of this little tiny star is a much, much bigger signal. And so that's a trick that we can use to actually find rocky planets that we might be able to study using space telescopes that are maybe not available to us today, but will be available soon. And so there's actually an example of that kind of system which was detected just in the last couple of years. So this is a system called TRAPPIST-1. So it was detected by the TRAPPIST telescope. It was the first planetary system discovered by that telescope. And it has uh, seven planets, all of which eclipse their star. And those seven planets, so this is actually kind of a fun thing. The star is tiny. It's about 10% the size of the sun. So if you put it next to Jupiter, it's about the same size as Jupiter. And their planets around the star line up sort of at about the same distance as the moons of Jupiter. So you can kind of think of this as a planetary system that looks sort of like the Jovian moon system. So the interesting thing is that three of these planets are far enough away from the star that they are maybe in a region where they might be cool enough to have liquid water, but not so cold that the water freezes. That's interesting. Uh, their sizes, their masses, and their radii suggest that at least some of them are rocky. That's really interesting. And so this is a very, very interesting system to try and look at in more detail. So we want to now look at these planets and ask, can we detect their atmospheres? And can we measure their temperatures and figure out what is actually in their atmospheres? 
Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that with Hubble. Even with this system, which is one of the best systems to be able to do this with, it's still a little bit beyond what we can do with Hubble. But fortunately, NASA has been constructing for the last five or 10 years uh, a bigger and better version of Hubble. So the James Webb Space Telescope is going to launch in about two years. Uh, it's a bigger telescope, bigger mirror, collects more light. That's good. Uh, it looks at sort of red optical and mainly infrared wavelengths. So looking in the infrared is really good for measuring the temperatures of these planets. It's also really good for detecting molecules like water and methane and CO in the atmospheres of these planets. So uh, the James Webb Telescope, we think, could actually perhaps detect the atmospheres of some of these small rocky planets orbiting TRAPPIST-1. So not quite there yet, possibly there soon. With the big catch, which is that uh, if those planets have clouds in their atmospheres, that actually makes this much harder to detect. And so that's what we found with the hot Jupiters, is that all those amazing cloud maps that I show you are really, really cool to think about, uh, but they're also actually um, masking part of the signal that we're trying to detect when we measure the atmospheric compositions of these planets. So uh, if they're cloudy, we might not be able to do it even with James Webb, but we're crossing our fingers and hoping some of them, some of them maybe don't have clouds. All right, so going back to the original question that I asked at the beginning of my talk, um, are we alone? Uh, so we know from these surveys that planets are common. So that, if you want to ask what, what the probability of life elsewhere might be, lots of planets is a good place to start. Whatever kind of planet it is that you think you need, if you have enough planets out there, surely some of them will meet whatever conditions you want to set. Uh, most planetary systems look very different than our own. Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. We don't really know what the requirements are for life, but there are certainly a whole lot of different kinds of planets out there. Many of those planets orbit stars, which are different than our own, stars that could be much cooler, stars that could be hotter. Some of them even orbit pairs of stars, or they orbit one star with another star nearby. That's something that we didn't really expect to see. Uh, but we're not yet quite able to get to the point where we can ask, are there signs of life on these planets? but we're getting closer and closer. So hopefully sometime soon. With that, I'll take questions. Questions for Heather? Right, so you could make the same measurement by measuring the motion of the star on the sky, so that's called astrometry. Uh, we can measure that motion more precisely right now using the Doppler shift, but there's a space telescope called Gaia that has been uh, in orbit for the last couple of years that was built to measure those astrometric motions very precisely, and Gaia will be the first telescope that could probably detect planets that way. Yeah, so even in our own solar system, our gas giant planets did not form exactly where we see them today. We have evidence by looking at the Kuiper belt and the asteroid belt that they must have moved around. So, and it's very possible that around these stars, you had things that started out where Jupiter is and then something caused them to migrate in, maybe interactions with a gas disk. Uh, that used to be the sort of accepted answer. Uh, recently, people have revisited those models about how you form giant planets, and there's now uh, some good arguments to say maybe you could form them in place. That's a very kind of uncomfortable thing to think of, but it, it may be possible. Mm -hmm. okay. Jennifer, yeah. Um, what is the biggest planet that you described so far? Yeah, uh, so we see planets that are more than 10 times the size of Jupiter, the mass of Jupiter, rather. So we see planets that get pretty big. Eventually, when you make these things bigger and bigger, uh, they start fusing hydrogen in their core and they become stars. So there's some tipping point where you're a planet just below that, and when you get big enough, then you turn into a star. So we see things kind of all along that spectrum. Yeah? Are there any planets that are remotely similar to Earth? We see planets that are the same size as Earth. 
we see some planets that seem to be rocky and maybe the size of the Earth, and we see some of those planets far enough away from their star that they might be the same temperature as the Earth, but that's about as much as we've been able to tell so far. So we don't know if they actually have an Earth-like atmosphere or if they have liquid water or signs of life. Uh, not exactly. Not exactly. Yep. We, we have to do some more checking to know for sure. But there's so many planets out there that I think I'm pretty optimistic that some of them will be like the Earth. Yeah. Uh, has you looked at Earth from some of the planetary explorers that continue your hunting and seen life forms on Earth doing the same part of the sun? Yeah. Um, we actually can do that by looking at the moon during a lunar eclipse. So when you look at the moon, so during a lunar eclipse, you have the sun, the earth, and the moon, and the, the earth is blocking sunlight. So the light, the red glow that you see on the moon is actually light coming through the atmosphere of the earth. And so you can actually measure that as if the earth was a planet going in front of another star and detect things in the earth's atmosphere. Uh, so you can actually learn quite a bit about earth's atmosphere that way. Okay, did you get light? Yeah, the red edge. Yeah, you can see the red edge. Uh, you can see oxygen too, I think, maybe. Maybe ozone. Yeah, so there's a little bit about, of a debate about what you would need to see in order to know that there's life on the planet. And the answer is that it's complicated, and there, you could invent planets that maybe have spectra that look like the Earth, but aren't necessarily Earth-like and don't necessarily have life. So even if you can measure the composition of the atmosphere really well, it's not a simple thing to say from that composition, must there be life on the planet? Yeah, question in the back. Yeah, I have one question. Is it possible that you have any, is there any way to detect a moon around one of these large gas giants? Yeah. yeah, so if the planet goes in front of its star and that planet has a moon, depending on where the moon is in its orbit, the moon will also go in front of the star and, and cause a smaller eclipse. Uh, the moon going around the planet also makes the planet sort of move back and forth. So even if you don't see the moon, you might detect that little bobble of the planet. Uh, that's in theory. We have never detected a moon, at least not so far, because it turns out, in theory, it works. In practice, it's still really difficult to do unless the moon is really big. Okay, time for one more question. Yep. And then people can come down and talk to Heather while we switch over to the yes. panel. All right, here, last question right there. Oh, sorry, I think there's two questions. So maybe. How does gravity keep us on the ground? Uh, so gravity wants to pull us towards the center of the Earth. So no matter where uh, we are on the Earth, we feel that pull down towards the middle. So if you're here in Los Angeles, you feel that pull. And if you're in Australia, on the other side of the Earth, it feels exactly the same. You feel that same pull towards the center of the Earth. We're all upside down in Australia. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> all right. All right, thanks everybody. Oh, let me turn this back on. All right, let's thank Heather again. on the road. All right. We had a tape emergency. There was no tape uh, to display our gorgeously handwritten specialties. Um, and now we have tape, so it's, we can all go ahead. So my name is Jessie Christensen. I'm a staff scientist at the NASA Exoplanet Science Institute, which is just around the corner on the Caltech campus. Uh, so I can answer, hopefully, questions about exoplanets, NASA, or variable stars, which is when you're looking at stars for a long time, looking for planets, you find a lot of variable stars, which some people are interested in, and most exoplanet scientists are like, oh, it's another variable star. Uh, so I've seen a lot of those. And I'll just pass it on, and everybody will introduce ourselves, and then we'll start taking questions. Hello. So yeah, I'm Michael. I'm working on exoplanet atmospheres. Um, yeah, you can also ask me questions about supernovae and cosmology, and I'll try to answer. I'm Nicole. I'm a grad student in planetary science. You can ask me questions about exoplanets, planet formation, or planetary atmospheres. Uh, and I'm Lee. I'm a grad student in astronomy, and you can ask me about uh, galaxies, the solar system, or oh, well, stars. Thank you. <laughs> Not actually seeing these planets this crossing the star surface. 
That's right. So one of the disadvantages of the transit technique, when you're looking for these transits, is that there are many things that look like transits. So when Heather showed that eclipse, uh, the transit of Venus, the star was covered in sunspots. You saw that the star was blotchy. And some of those star spots were as big as Venus. Uh, and they move across the surface of the sun as the sun rotates. So if you measure the brightness of the sun with time, you can actually see the brightness of the sun changing. So if you're looking for something like a planet, the fact that the star is already doing its own thing, it's got its own business going on, uh, is really difficult to extract sometimes. So you're looking for really quiet stars that are really boring, middle-aged stars, not doing anything, home on the couch, looking for planets around those stars. Uh, the problem with the small stars that Heather brought up, how it's easier to find planets around the small stars because the dips are bigger, small stars are noisier. They're actually doing a lot more, and that makes it harder to find them. So once you've found a planet around a small star, you're golden, but it's still difficult. But there's lots of things that look like planets going around stars, including small stars going around big stars, for instance. Right, so uh, uh, what we're talking about is the fact that sunspots don't last forever. They come and go. So sometimes the sun doesn't have a lot of sunspots and sometimes it has lots. So if you're observing a star for a long enough period of time that you can actually watch the evolution of the activity on the surface, of the sunspots on the surface, then you can disentangle the different time scales of the variability. Um, but a lot of these surveys, especially the ones on the ground, you can only look at a star for a certain amount of time while it's up, which, which season it's available for, which is another reason why it's good to go to space, because there isn't uh, a season in the same way. Um, it can be that the, the time scales are very similar on the short orbits that you're looking at. That's a really good question. So uh, one of the things I do is I work at the NASA Exoplanet Archive, and one of the things we do is archive light curves of stars, so people who have studied light curves. Um, part of the reason that the field was really revolutionized in the last two decades is basically the invention of CCDs. So these are the thing inside your iPhone that's actually taking the photos, digital cameras. Uh, when we moved from photographic plates to digital cameras is when we got to the precision that you could see these tiny dips. Um, so very deep things, uh, you can go back in time, there are, like, there's a hundred years worth of photographic plates in the Harvard archive, which is very cool. Um, very deep things you can go back and find in archives, but things that are caused by planets, the very shallow things, that the point is that the data were never good enough until the last two decades. Uh, it's a great, so the question was, uh, I think, uh, so there are a couple, mo actually many moons around Jupiter. One of these is called Europa. Uh, we're pretty sure it has an ice layer and, it, and it's a liquid planet, a largely liquid planet underneath and, the question, and there might be life under it. And the question is, how can we find out if there's life? Um, and so the, an there, the answer is, uh, there are a couple missions planned to do this. I don't remember any of their names, but there's a planned mission to, to do a, Thank the Europa Clipper. Thank you, the Europa Clipper. Yes, <laughs> there you go. Um, which is basically going to fly, uh, fly by Europa, and I, I think they do this with Europa as uh, the same thing as with Enceladus, right? Where it's basically going to fly through a plume of gas coming out, coming off the surf, like through basically off the surface of Europa, and to basically like take chemical samples, whereas, you know, as Heather was talking about, like, figuring out the chemical composition of an atmosphere by looking at the light, you can do this literally by also just sending something through it with some in instruments on it that can measure composition of what they're going through. And so that'll tell you something about conditions under, where it's under, uh, under the surface. And then there's another mission, although this is the more distant future, I also forget this name, um, that plan is actually planning on drilling partially down into the surface, like landing. And it's not going to last very long, but the idea is that it will actually like take data on, the, on and under the surface of Europa. So with, with, with space missions is the answer to your question.
Um, yeah, so the distribution of uh, actual planets actually has a peak, uh, but the peak is uh, something like two or three di, right? So like there are actually way more smaller planets than bigger planets, but the thing is we have a really hard time finding these smaller planets, right? Because like how easy a planet is to find, uh, especially depends on the ratio of the planet size to the star size, right? So a Earth like planet produces a transit that's something like 80 parts per million. Uh, whereas for these hot Jupiters, we have a transit that's like 1%, and that's simply much easier to find. So I think, just I want to just add to that. I think the plot you were talking about in Heather's plot was the mass versus radius plot. The point is, we only have masses measured for the big planets because we can measure them. So that made it look like there were many more big planets than little planets, just it was just that plot. It's because we don't have the masses measured for a lot of the little planets. The bigger planets are the easiest ones to find. So those were the ones we found first and we found a lot of. As we've pushed down into the smaller, smaller and smaller planets, they, they seem to be more common, but they're also much more difficult to measure the mass of. Uh, so that's why on that plot, it did look like there were many more big planets. And I, when she put it up, I was like, that's ah, kind of a little misleading. Um, but it's just because we don't have masses for the small things. If that plot was like radius versus period or something, you would have seen this incredibly large population of small planets that just don't have masses measured. Sorry. Yeah, that was my question. I, I have another question. If, if you have a uh, rock, bigger uh, planet, if you have some aliens living there, it would be much harder for them to get out of there. Yeah, so there was actually just a paper that came out. Did, did anybody read that one that came out? Okay, so there was a paper that just came out a week or two ago about, um, so these super-Earths, so these uh, rocky planets that are maybe twice the size of Earth, um, the gravity on the surface of these planets would be so high that launching rockets off the surface of a planet would be prohibitively, prohibitively energy expensive. Like, they did some calculation in the paper that it would take like all of the energy on the planet to try and get off the surface. So if civilization has arisen on planets like super-Earths, they either need to be much better about building efficient rockets than we are, um, or or they're not spacefaring. Uh, so that, I mean, it was just a bit of a fun paper that came out because obviously there's so much we don't know about what life could look like on other planets, but it was, we hadn't really thought about the fact that all these super Earths, yeah, it would be really hard to get off them. <laughs> so yeah, there's actually a nice game called Kerbal Space Program. <laughs> um, it uses realistic physics, so you can actually build rockets and see how hard it is to like get off the planet. Um, and it turns out that the mass of the rocket that you need is as exponential as a function of the speed that you need to reach. Right, so if you need to go like twice as fast because your planet is just more massive, uh, then you need a lot more fuel. It's not just twice as much fuel. Right, I think I read somewhere that like, you need something like a Saturn V just to like, launch a small satellite into orbit around one of these super Earths. So there are a couple of different techniques. Heather talked about the RV technique, the transit technique, and she even talked about the direct imaging technique, which she said wasn't very promising, the firefly analogy, that whole thing. But that has been, there's been advances in that. So the larger the telescope, the more likely we can get, photo, more photons we can basically get, and the more possibility of actually detecting those planets. So there's kind of fronts on all ends that we can work on. So direct imaging is one of them. There's been advances to make bigger telescopes. You've probably heard about the TMT, the 30 meter telescope that's on there, that's kind of on the agenda for trying to basically better detect planets that way. Um, astrometry, RV, basically on all fronts, we're trying to push to get to smaller planets, basically. But. I don't explain Oh gosh, okay. <laughs> um, so I think for the moment, in terms of population statistics and most gain and most planets, it's gonna be transiting. So with the test was just launched, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, and that's gonna be looking at the entire sky and basically looking at the brightest stars and trying to see planets passing in front of it. So Kepler, which Heather talked about, basically looked at a portion of the sky, which is basically equivalent to your hand, kind of if you put your hand up in the night sky, and it stared at the same portion for the vast majority of its survey. So now we're gonna, with the test, we're gonna be looking at all of the planets that are close by, these, that are basically surrounding these really bright stars. So we're gonna get a huge boom of planets from that. So I think in the near future, that's gonna really be the big one.
So, so uh, to find, to, to characterize the atmosphere of a planet like the Earth with James Webb would take all of the time that James Webb has. It would not be able to do any other science. So it's the fact that other astronomers want to do other things besides exoplanets. I don't understand why, but um, apparently it's not just an exoplanet telescope. It's supposed to do things like measure dark matter and dark energy and these other things. Um, so if, if, if they gave us all of the hours that James Webb had, we'd be able to characterize one exoplanet like the Earth. And that's just because the signal is super tiny still. So remember what one of the things Heather said was if you could launch a 15 meter telescope into space. So this is a concept that's being discussed by NASA called Louvoir, the large UV optical infrared, it's a terrible name. It'll be renamed um, the Louvoir telescope. Um, kind of sounds like a toilet. Um, uh, so that's a 15 meter or 16 meter concept. Sorry? Oh yeah. Uh, that's better, let's go with that. Def definitely a museum in France. Um, so that's a concept that's being, that's being discussed where uh, the, the size of the telescope would be big enough and you'd be in space so that you'd be able to see planets like the Earth. Uh, but James Webb is not going to be able to look at planets like the Earth. It's going to be look, able to look at super-Earths and sub-Neptunes. Uh, and it's really just the fact that the signal is really tiny. I mean, if you think about the Earth and what fraction of the radius of the Earth is taken up by our atmosphere, it's a very, very, very small fraction. So that's the signal that we're looking for. We're just looking for the atmosphere of the rocky planet. We're not just looking for the planet. We're looking for changes caused by things in the atmosphere. So it's such a tiny measurement that even James Webb, which is going to be an incredible, amazing telescope, which is going to launch, uh, it's still not going to be enough. So it's really just the, it's, the bottleneck is still on our end, the size of the telescope that we can afford to build and not bankrupt the entire nation. Yeah, so like the fundamental uh, physical limit is that we have a li uh, finite number of photons from the atmosphere of this planet. So even if we can detect every single photon that hits JWST, uh, JWST is still not big enough. We just need a bigger mirror to collect more photons. Yes, bigger bucket. So that's a great question. So we do see planets that are orbiting multi-stars. So binary star systems, you'll see a planet that's going around two different stars. But the whole thing is that when planets are kind of forming, they can definitely interact with each other. They can interact with sort of planetesimals in the disk when they're forming. And kind of what we're seeing later on is the end state of that formation. So it's kind of been so long by the time we can actually observe them that we're assuming they're not going to collide with their star or something like that because we wouldn't see it or with their uh, cluster or something like that because the planets haven't actually formed then. But. <laughs> so we have looked at some clusters and haven't found any planets. <gasps> so which may be evidence that you're right, like maybe pl a cluster environment is a bad place for planets to be born because it's really crowded, there's lots of stars. Um, we haven't looked at enough clusters to make a definitive statement, but, but the first few that we looked at didn't have any planets that we could find. So that was kind of tantalizing evidence. So that's exciting, we're gonna keep looking. Oh, what a great question. So yes, there, um, uh, James Webb has an early release science program. So the nominal lifetime for James Webb is five years, uh, which actually is not a lot of time to get data. Uh, so we'd like to hit the ground running. We'd like to know as soon as possible how are the different instruments performing, what's the best instrument and the best behaving mode of that instrument to do the observations. Um, so there's this early release science where the whole community got together and said, here are the things the benchmarks, the standard things, we just want to go and make this observation and that'll tell us that these instruments are behaving well or not. Um, so there was a, a, a large 
exoplanet community effort to put to choose a list of targets like these are the ones we want to look at straight away uh, and those data are going to become available immediately to everybody in the community with the idea being then we can all make more informed decisions about what we're going to apply for in the future uh, after that it goes back to a normal we call it a time allocation committee where they say okay tell us what you want to look at everybody works their guts off writing proposals and submits them and then a group of people get together and read them all and say okay these are the top ranks ones these will get them time uh, I, I, yes, two of the trappers, I think two of the three that are in the habitable zone are, are, are early, early release science. Um, because the point of early release science isn't necessarily to do the most exciting science, it's to, to really benchmark the instruments. They chose the biggest, brightest things really to start with, to say, okay, these are the big booming signals which should be easy to see, but they did sneak some trappers planets in there because why not? Okay, good question. Mysteries. Um, I mean, so hot Jupiters was one of them. The fact that we expected, well, planet formation. Do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. We don't know how planets form. Um, so the very beginning of planet formation is kind of up for debate among a lot of people. And we're not really at a consensus for the exact way planets form in general. So there's a certain idea that, you know, you're going to have all the rock that's in your, your disk surrounding your star. It's going to clump up together. And eventually, if it gets big enough while there's still gas in that disk, you're going to start accreting gas. But all these sort of intermediate steps in that process aren't entirely well understood. Uh, Heather alluded to recently that there's been recent work that suggested that hot Jupiters can form in situ, they can form in place. So we don't have a full understanding of the way these planets even form to even kind of begin to answer that. So, so much is unknown. So yeah, to add on to that, um, here's a typical process for studying an exoplanet atmosphere. So you take some data, you analyze the data, uh, then you make a model, and you compare the model to the data, and you find that they don't match at all. Right? So then you try to tweak the model, and it still doesn't match. You try to take more data, it still doesn't match. And then you throw up your hands and say, hmm, I don't know. So yeah, happened to me uh, three times so far. <laughs> <laughs> Today, yes. And it's a very typical process, right? It's not just me. Yes. <laughs> uh, is there any uh, possibility that we uh, intelligent light? What is the probability of that? Oh, um, well, <laughs> it's, it's not something that I can really estimate. Um, yeah, maybe you would like to hear back. So, have you heard of Drake equation? The Drake equation? Yeah. Yeah, so one of the things that was the goal of Kepler was to measure one of the terms in the Drake equation, which was the frequency of planets like the Earth. And we're still working on that calculation. Uh, turns out, it turns out stars are noisier than we thought, which is a bummer. Um, but so, and the Drake equation has, I think, like eight terms in it, and the frequency of Earth-sized planets is like the third or fourth. So there's still four or five more terms in the Drake equation that we just have no idea about. Uh, and they're all things like the fraction of Earth-like planets that develop life, the fraction of planets that have life that get uh, intelligence, the lifetime of a civilization that's intelligent. So we just have zero idea about those. Um, so it's hard to speculate. But it's exciting that, Earth, that planets seem to be common. That's like step one. Planets seem to be common. Oh, well, this actually, okay, never mind, I do have, uh, I, the, my first part of the answer was going to be, I wasn't sure if, if either of you work on um, our, like RV data, but a lot of people in exoplanets, which I do not work on, seem to be really excited about the data release because it lets you really, really, re like, reconstrain uh, the masses of stars and therefore the masses of planets. So the, uh, some, some of the researchers in the department have been talking about, like, before the, the data release, you need to, we knew the masses of a bunch of planets to precision of, I think, 5 or 10%, um, something like that. And then with this new release, suddenly that number can be brought down to 2%. Which And the exciting thing about that is, like, knowing the mass of the planet entirely depends on knowing the mass of the star. Because 
um, and, and sorry, and radius uh, too. So that's exciting. As for uh, stars, um, I mean, there's just there's just so much. The, the, the also relevant to to galaxies is that, like the one of the primary stated missions of Gaia, right, is to sort of make a make a more detailed map of the the Milky Way because the idea is that you're observing order a billion stars um, out to a significant di like distance from the the solar neighborhood, and so. A lot of people who would probably call themselves galactic archaeologists, like they want to know what kinds of stars are where in the galaxy, like where are the metal rich stars, where are the metal poor stars, where are the massive stars, where are the are the low mass stars, and Gaia just lets you do that in a way that has never been done before, because it gives you distant. I mean, uh, so Heather talked about doing astrometry, like measuring where a star's position on the sky is. Equally important is um, measuring proper motion which is sort of a way to measure distance to star. Where basically, it, it, it's, it's a much fancier version of if I put my finger in front of my face and I close one eye and then I switch to the other eye and my finger moves a little bit, I can figure out how far my finger is from my face based on how much it moves across my field of view when I switch between my eyes. And this is basically, instead of your two eyes, you have the Earth on one side of the sun, you have the telescope on one side of the, in one place in its orbit versus the other place. Um, and so you can get incredibly accurate uh, measurements of distances to stars from that. So that's probably one of the most exciting things about it from the perspective of somebody who's really interested in stars. So that's a great question. So actually, for most of these systems, they're hot Jupiters, and they're very close into their star. So we usually just assume they're tidally locked. Okay. Uh, the tidal locking time scales are usually much shorter than the ages of the systems. I that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's kind of like how the Earth is uh, the moon is around the Earth, and you always see the same face of the moon going around. So, so that's called tidal locking. You don't really know. So for the vast majority of them are tidally locked. Okay. Um, yeah. Just, a, just a, 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 a lot of them are tidally locked, but I, I just happen to know someone who just finished their thesis here recently did a whole part of their the Marta, did a whole part of their thesis on actually like using very high resolution spectra to measure the spins of planets. So I, I don't know what this is about the rates, but certainly there's some of these that rotate and that can tell you about different formation mechanisms, which is exciting. Those are further out, sir, uh, further out planets though than the hot Jupiters are. Um, and if it's tidally locked, then the rotation rate is exactly the same as the warm patrol period. So we actually know the rotation rate very precisely. So a variable star, every star is a variable star if you look with enough precision. Um, variable stars are typically stars that are doing more than our sun. Our sun is pretty stable. It's a pretty boring middle-aged star. It has the occasional acne, but that's okay. So once, the star, once our sun gets older, um, it'll move through different phases of its life. Uh, and in particular, there's an interesting phase uh, where it'll start, it'll start basically breathing. Um, so uh, it'll, it'll expand a little bit and then contract a little bit and expand a little bit and contract a little bit. Uh, and that'll actually change its luminosity, its brightness, and we'll be able to map that with time. Uh, we use these stars, we see them throughout the galaxy and we see them through other galaxies as well. Uh, we know the rate that they do this and the luminosity are related uh, so we can see how far away they are. We use these as standard candles. It's like we know how bright a 60 watt bulb is. So if you're looking at a bulb that's 100 yards away, you can tell how bright it is. Um, so we use these as, as ways to measure distances throughout the galaxy and through the nearby galaxies. Um, so they're really interesting uh, if you like distances. They're usually just annoying if you're looking for planets because it makes the light curve be doing too much when you're trying to find a dip in the, the whole light curve doing this and you're like, where's my, where's my planet? But if you find planets around variable stars, it's interesting too because think about how life on our planet uh, is fairly tied to the, to the flux from the sun, where a certain temperature and changing our temperature by a few degrees is having really large effects. So imagine if we had a sun which was changing its brightness by 10% every few hours or few days. Like, 
would we be able to survive? Do any planets with life survive past this, you know, past the middle age part of their star's life? You know, we talk about the fact it's going to, the sun's going to blow up in five billion years. Before it does that, it's going to start doing wacky stuff with its luminosity. So maybe we don't have to think about five billion years. We don't even have that long. That's all right. Five billion years is a long time for any children in the audience. It's okay. All right. Yes, so the, the last event on the calendar is for June, on the flyer outside. That's for this year's calendar, but we're already working on next year's calendar, uh, which will start in July. So there won't be a gap. There'll be monthly lectures every month continuing in July. The next event we have is actually one of our Astronomy on Taps. Um, so if... <laughs> okay, some people here are Astronomy on Tap fans. Um, so June 4th at De Wolfskopf Pub in downtown Pasadena. Uh, it's a Monday night. Uh, there'll be some fun short astronomy talks. There'll be prizes. There'll be beer. There'll be quizzes. It's a lot of fun. So June 4th, grab a flyer. That's our next event. But then, yes, there'll be a lecture in June, and there'll be another one in July. That's a good question. Um, I worked on the NASA Kepler mission up in the Bay Area for about four years as a staff scientist. Um, and uh, I, my husband uh, was a postdoc at Berkeley working on galaxy formation. And he got a faculty job here at Caltech. And I got a staff scientist position at the NASA Exoplanet Science Institute. So we solved the two-body problem, which never happens, which is very exciting. Uh, so we moved down here about four years ago, five years ago. Oh my god, it's going to be five years in August. OK, five years ago. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I majored in astronomy, um, and after that, I was like, well, I want to try something new. So um, I went to like work as a software engineer. Uh, yeah, did that for two years, and then I was like, well, you know, want to try something new again. <laughs> and you know, I still have the energy to do graduate school, so I decided to apply. And yeah, that's how I started here as a graduate student. Uh, I did my degree in physics, my undergraduate degree in physics. I always loved astronomy. I worked on galaxies back, it feels like a lifetime ago, but wasn't that long ago. Um, realized that galaxies are way too big. I uh, wanted to look at planets, a lot smaller, kind of closer. Um, so yeah, so I just really worked on planet formation, like planetary formation, planetary detection throughout undergrad and kind of visited here for grad school. Uh, actually, Heather is my advisor. Um, met with Heather. She was awesome. I was like, yeah, let's, let's do this. And I guess the rest is history. Yeah, I have a similar story. I, uh, I studied physics and astronomy in college, and I was like, what do I want to do after this? And grad school just seemed, you know, academia seems like a pretty great route. And in general, grad school seems like a you know, great place where you can be among people that are all interested in the same thing as you. It's, you know, really an intellectual, you know, it's like a challenge, it's, which is cool. And, and everyone, it, when you get excited about the work that you're doing, it, it can be a really great thing. Yes, that's a great question. So there actually is an issue with, uh, there's something called, which has been kind of coined the Fulton Gap. Uh, there's basically a population of planets that are missing, for lack of a better word. Um, you have planets that are super Earths, and then you kind of have a missing gap, and then you kind of have the Neptune and the Neptune kind of planets. So there are certain types of planets that are too small to hold on to their atmospheres. Their cores are just too small, and they can't hold on, and they're too close. But mostly it's just they're too small. So these planets, the hot Jupiters, aren't on top of their star. Some of them could be in a couple day orbits. They're not that close to their star. So yeah, you're going to have some effects if you're too small to hold on to your atmosphere to actually, it's called a like, photo evaporation. You're basically losing part of your atmosphere and it strips away parts of the planet. Um, but for these planets, they're very massive. They have very large cores. They have very large atmospheres that then kind of hold themselves up and hold themselves together. And there are some hot Jupiters where we do see basically the photo evaporation. We can see that there's um, like H alpha emission. There, there's this cloud of material surrounding the planet, which is basically the solar radiation is ablating the surface of the planet or the, the upper atmosphere of the planet. Um, so this does happen, but they are big enough to mostly hold on. It's a battle. It's a battle between the solar pressure and the gravity. And they're big enough to win, but there are planets that are too small to win that we don't see. So there's this missing population. That's a mystery. Um, so what for smaller planets like the Earth, I guess right now we have to look uh, at smaller stars, but then I guess that means they'll be closer to the star, be in the habitable zone, and it also maybe means, I guess, more radiation from the star, and I don't know if smaller stars are also less stable, so even though those are the 
Yeah, that's absolutely true. So, so M dwarfs, which are these small, cool stars, you need to be closer. So some of these planets which are in the habitable zone, so the right temperature, uh, might be tidally locked. And what does that mean for life? Could life live on a tidally locked planet? Uh, depends on the atmosphere. You have to start making assumptions, like how does the heat get redistributed? Maybe they only live at the terminator, like the edge of the day-night zone. Um, M dwarfs also put out thousands of times more UV radiation than planets, like, than stars like the sun. Uh, what does that mean for life? Like, you know, you can imagine if you were getting thousands of doses, thousands of times a dose of high-energy radiation, maybe DNA never grows and becomes a thing. Uh, it just gets mutated. Um, so yeah, there are definitely issues, but. Again, like Heather said, we're impatient. We just want to look somewhere, and we know that we don't have the technology yet to look around stars like the sun, so we're, we're shortcutting, and we're seeing what we can see. Um, so yeah, spacecraft, spacecraft like Kepler, um, they are theoretically able to detect planets the size of the Earth. Um, and in fact, Kepler was able to detect Earth-like planets in Earth-like orbits around Earth-like stars. I mean, sun-like stars. Uh, unfortunately, the spacecraft failed a bit earlier than we would have liked it to. Uh, so we only got like three and a half years of data. So we haven't actually found like a very close Earth analog. Uh, but the other problem is, even if we find one of these, it's really hard to study their atmospheres, right? Because like we can only measure the combined light of star and planet, and almost all of that light is going to be dumb, is going to be the star. So when you have a smaller star, not only is it easier to find the planet, it's easier to study the planet's atmosphere. Oh. <laughs> uh, could you talk a little bit about um, how much of your observations you look at just by eye versus how much is just a computer churning through data? Mm -hmm. um, let's see, how much, let's see. So, how do, when do I begin? <laughs> right, okay, so suppose that you are trying to discover a planet, right, using the transient method. Uh, usually what you do is you take a bunch of pictures of the same area of sky. You just point a telescope there and you keep on, keep on taking picture after picture, potentially for years, right, that's what Kepler did. And, um, well, the picture, the actual data is just a picture, right? You see a picture and you see a bunch of stars, right? There's no way you're going to see anything from that. So you had to write a program to measure the brightness of every star, like for every image. Uh, and then you see something called a light curve, right, which is a plot of uh, the brightness of the star versus time. And yeah, you can like look at that visually, right, just like plot it and see whether you see a transit. Um, but to find planets efficiently, you need to look at thousands and thousands of stars, right? So you have a really hard time, yeah. <laughs> Well, even but grad students, graduate students are lazy, right? We don't want to look look through ten thousand light curves. Uh, so what people do is they uh, write a program to find exactly what we are looking for, right? Like a pe periodic dip in the brightness. Uh, yeah. So how much of it do you? Um, you you almost never like look at the raw data to do your final science, but you do look at plots that you make. Uh, the other thing is that it kind of depends on what you're looking at. So if you're trying to detect planets, a lot of times you're just going to kind of automate that because they're looking at thousands of stars and you don't want to stare at them independently. Um, but if you're trying to kind of categorize atmospheres or things like that, a lot of times the signals you're getting are really small. So uh, Heather showed that plot and you had the little tiny blue annulus that was the atmosphere. So if you're trying to get information about that atmosphere, it's really small compared to what you're getting from the star. So a lot of times you'll have noise from the instrument, because none of our instruments are perfect. Um, so you'll have noise from the instrument that you can't always see what you're looking for in that data. So a lot of times, like uh, when I'm looking at an atmosphere or looking at a light curve to look at an atmosphere, I'll stare at a light curve that doesn't look like pretty much anything. Um, but then when you kind of have a, an instrumental noise model or what you expect the data to look like and you kind of factor all that in, you kind of will get a clean curve. So we stare at a lot of data quite often, but just not particularly efficiently or effectively. We try though. Uh, oh wait, uh, just uh, b before I, just an interesting historical note, like just for for a sense of how astronomy has changed over the past hundred years. I mean, back in the either when when, was, when did Cecilia Payne work? Twenties or thirties? Like, thir yeah, ish. Like like be, you know, beginning of the twentieth century, there was a group of women at Harvard who 
spent almost all their time looking at spectra of stars. But oh wait, so Heather didn't actually show any picture of spectra. But when us grad students or, or current researchers think of like looking at a spectra, we think of like a nice looking clean plot of like brightness over over wavelength. Then you get this really you can see lines very clearly. This is more like you take a photographic plate and you put a prism over a telescope and you get just a band and it's like looks really messy and they're they're lines but they're literally like lines they're bands across it and the, these women would just like catalog stars and, and enti this was entirely by eye because when you have photographic plates you can't do data analysis in the traditional I mean you do data analysis but not in the traditional sense and so even like when we didn't have computers uh, we were able to like learn from that what the composition of our sun was, what the composition of most stars were. So the field has changed radically in the past. One quick story about why we shouldn't always just stare at data. So I can't remember his name, but there was a, an astronomer who was looking at Venus and just staring at Venus and thought when he was looking at Venus that he saw can uh, canals and all of this wonderful fluvial features and all of this great structure. And it turns out he was just staring at his own optic nerves. It was a reflection in the telescope. So sometimes it's not always great to just stare at data and hope you get what you're getting. But. There's a question in the back. Yeah. <laughs> So TESS is the NASA mission that got launched last month. Um, it's doing its commissioning, so everything's working really excellently. They released an image a week ago to show that the cameras are working, which is really exciting. Um, go find the image. It was quite funny because uh, they released a JPEG, just a flat JPEG of a section of a CCD, uh, and the entire astronomy community was just like, show me the JPEG. And we just like went and like ran it through all the software and turned it into Fitz images and we had stars and, and they were like, wait, wait, what are you doing? It's like, you, this is all you gave us. We're going to do science on it. Um, so they're like, just wait one month. In one month, we will give you the full Fitz image of all four cameras. And it's like, but, but you gave us a JPEG now. We, we like this. We'll do this. Um, so yes, everybody's already doing science on the JPEG, the, 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 the press release JPEG, which is hilarious. Um, we're just dying for real data. Uh, but yes, everything's looking great. Um, it had its uh, third, uh, it has to do this series of burns to get, like thruster burns to get into its final orbit. It's got this very cool orbit. It's done three of the six, and actually the third one was so good, it doesn't need to do a fourth one, um, which is nice, because that means later in the mission when we need more fuel, we'll have it. Um, so it's got to do two more burns, and then we're expecting the real science to start in the middle of June. <sighs> <laughs> so yes, that's the test update. TESS is just broadband optical. It's just taking images of the sky in a very wide field of view. There's no, there's no spectral information on TESS. But uh, for other, other, anybody want to talk about atmospheres maybe? Um, right, how many bands? Let's see. So for example, for HHD, um, you, commonly, you commonly use uh, STIS and with C3. And the for, yeah, those are instruments, right? They, ha they have different uh, wavelength coverage. Uh, for the first one, it's like seven, it's basically optical, uh, visible light. For the second one, it's 1.1 to 1.6 microns. Uh, and I think Hydro also mentioned Spitzer. Uh, now, Spitzer used to have four bands, I think. Uh, but then, like, it ran out of coolant. Well, it was expected, right? Because it wouldn't expect it to last this long. Uh, and now we use two bands. There's 3.6 microns and 4.5 microns. So yeah, that's um, kind of the coverage of the most common instruments. So uh, a little more about Spitzer. So you need to be very cool to be able to get to the longer wavelengths. So right now we can only use the shorter infrared wavelengths. So 3.6, 4.5 microns are what's currently working. But earlier in Spitzer's life, it had uh, liquid helium uh, coolant. So it was able to get down to much colder temperatures so it could look at further wavelengths. But when it runs out of coolant, you can't get to those wavelengths. But Keck, which Heather also talked about, um, you can get spectra, depending on the instrument that you use. Um, when I use Keck, I look at one wavelength, uh, about four microns, but it depends on what you're doing. So different instruments have different ranges, basically. Well, yeah, I should also mention that the, the HST instruments are spectrographs, right? So you don't get like one measurement. Uh, you get a whole spectrum. 
And depending on how good the spectrum is, you can divide that into as many bands as you want. But yeah, usually, like, it doesn't make sense to do more than 30 or so. So before, when I said that James Webb's nominal life is five years, part of that's driven by the coolant. James Webb is another infrared spacecraft and needs to be kept very cool in order to do its, in, in order to make very precise measurements. JD, but James Webb, uh, to try and keep it cool, it's got six solar shades that's like six layers of mylar, all one after the other, to try and keep as much of the solar radiation away as possible. Um, and this was the thing, if you've heard about the delay, um, these are huge sun shields, uh, like the size of this room. Um, they practiced folding and unfolding them, and they tore them seven times. Uh, just little tears, but everybody in the astronomy community was just like, oh my god, oh my god. They tore the sun shields, they tore the sun shields. Um, so that's part of the reason for the delay. They need to not have that happen uh, anymore. Uh, so they're fixing that. Sure, that's a really great question. So, for instance, we could talk about this mission that's coming up that the, that's being studied, Louvois. So what we do is we start with a science case. We say, what measurement do we want to make? In this case, we want to study a planet like the Earth. So we know what kind of contrast level we have to get to. We know what kind of spectral resolution we need. We know how many photons we need to get from this star to make this. So that's why we go, okay, so in order to get this many photons, we need a 15-meter telescope. Uh, we need the light to be stable to this... Uh, you know, to this temperature, so it needs to have this bigger sun shield. Um, so basically you start from the science case and you work out what you need. Then typically what happens is you come back with a price tag for that, and it's very big. <laughs> so then you have to start making trades. You go, okay, what could we do with an 8-meter telescope? If we can't afford a 16-meter telescope, what could we do with an 8-meter telescope? And it's like, okay, well, you could do Earth-sized planets around stars like that are half the size of the sun, and then you have to decide whether that's still scientifically compelling or not. So you start with this grand idea, and then you have to compromise. It's like everything in life. Um, and then you end up with a final thing. But, but basically, you go to the engineers and say, this is what I need. And then they say, OK, well, this is what I'm going to have to build. And this is you know, the stability of the electronics and the stability of the circuits that I'm going to need and that kind of thing. And then you work together to create this price tag. And then someone at NASA falls over. And does that drive like innovation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a really, that's a really interesting question. Lee looks excited. <laughs> I'm only going to be copycatting some, something someone said either a month or, or two months ago on this panel. Sarah was uh, someone else who works on exoplanets and gave this really cool example of um, uh, this, there's this technology uh, for, for ground-based and space-based, but particularly ground-based telescopes called adaptive optics, where, I mean, as Heather said, looking through an atmosphere is a pain in the butt for astronomers because it introduces spectral lines, it blurs out the stars. Um, and so one uh, way to sort of not, not get rid of that effect, but try to compensate for it, is use a system called adaptive optics, AO, which is where the mirror, your big mirror on the telescope <laughs> actually, um, actually uh, has a bunch of little motors on the back, and so the mirror can flex in certain ways. And what you do is you shine a, you either use, you either look at a bright star in the sky, because all, all stars in theory should just be point sources, right? And you know, on the sky they're smeared out by the atmosphere, by turbulence, but really, they're so angularly small, they should just be point sources. And so you say, okay, there's a blob on the sky near what I want to look at. I know it should be a point source. Then you have a computer figure out how to distort the mirror in such a way that that blob, like the way, basically, don't even say wavefront, but like the light, com that, the light that should produce a point source comes through the atmosphere and is distorted, and you can teach the mirror to anti-distort the light, basically. So you can, repro you can reproduce the light source. That's super cool for astronomers. It's also super cool, apparently, for um, certain kinds of uh, medical imaging techniques, like looking, uh, looking through, through, skin, through the skin, I, I think either, at, either in, into the bloodstream or looking for some, I can't remember if it was that or cancer cells or something, but AO, which was developed by astronomers, and the military, kind of, but both, um, 
is being used for that. I mean, uh, I can't think of the, the, there. There are other examples. Oh, CCDs. You know, the, if, if anytime you take a selfie, be like, "Thanks, astronomers." Basically. Uh. <laughs> I actually thought you were going to tell the military story. So the AO story, the adaptive optics story. So astronomers come up with this way to look through the atmosphere very clearly. And the defense and you know, military is like, wait, we could look down through the atmosphere really clearly. So all of the astronomers who had been developing this just kind of like disappear for 10 years. <laughs> Come, come back having signed like some serious NDAs, write some research papers, and the military's like, yes, we can just happen to see through the atmosphere really clearly now. Doo, doo, doo. Um, so yeah, that's the story of how the military got AO as well. And they paid for our AO. Yay. All right, well, if there's no more questions, thank you very much, everybody, for coming tonight. Duck out to the telescopes if you haven't been already. The moon's very pretty. Uh, and feel free to come down and say hi. But again, thank you so much for coming.